Thank you, Yorko. In this part of the tutorial, we will do the demonstration. In this demo, we will explore sheet compression and fragmentation. To do that, we will use two examples, ICMP and Coab. But before going deep into that, let's see what OpenSheet is. To do that, we can go to OpenSheet.net. Here, as you can see, it is an open implementation of Sheik that has been used during the standardization process at the IETF and the LoRa labs. OpenSheik is written in Python, and its main objective is to help people to understand the protocol and to test new algorithms and features. Let's start with the first use case, which is compression and decompression and then fragmentation and reassembly of appendices. This is the architecture we will consider. In this case, we will have two instances running OpenSheet, one for the device here and the second one for the core. Packets will be tunneled over UDP between these two instances. In this case, the constraint network is modeled as an IPv4 UDP tunnel so that the core instance acts as a router between the IPv6 network and the device instance. The application, in this case, is a PINCIS eco application that can be run everywhere in the world from a terminal having IPv6 capability. Let's start with the core side. This program will be in charge of receiving the IPv6 packet. Then, once here, it will look at it and decide whether or not there are some chic rules that can be applied. Meaning that, if yes, the packet will be compressed and then, if necessary, fragmented. All these fragments or compressed packets will be sent to the device. Let's see this first part. The code necessary to run this core instance and also the device instance is on the repository. You just need to clone it and then go once inside to the develop branch. For our demo, what we did is to install your routine on a remote server that can be accessed through the SSH protocol. The code necessary to run the core is on OpenSheet examples, SCAPI, and then core3.py. Let's see what is inside. Here, as we can see, we first import the necessary libraries to use the code. Then, we define a new object in Python called Rule Manager. As Laurent explained before, rules are fundamental aspect in the Chic protocol. Inside OpenSheet, they are manipulated using a, an object called Rule Manager. This object provides a way to first describe the rules through a JSON structure, check its correctness, display the rules in the store in a more compact form than JSON, find in the store a valid rule to compress or fragment an incoming packet. To define a rule manager, the first thing to do is to call the add function, which takes as an input a JSON file. The first thing we define in this JSON file is the device ID, which is used as a unique identifier for the device, and is shared between the device and the core, meaning that the same set of rules or JSON file should be pre-stored inside the core and the device chic instances. In this case, the device ID is composed of UDP, which refers to the fact that in our case, the connection between the device and the core is done using the UDP protocol. Then we have IPv4 address. This is the public address of this machine. And finally, as it is UDP traffic, we need to define a UDP port. 
as we will see later on, this identifier can be different depending on the traffic we have. For the co-op case, for instance, UTP will be replaced by LoRaWAN and the IP address with the dev UI as defined in the LoRaWAN specification. Once we have this device ID defined, we have what we call a set of rules, or SOR. In this case, it corresponds to a compression rule and two fragmentation rules. Let's see what we have inside the compression rule. The first thing is a rule ID. We have six in decimal, with a rule ID length of three. This means that this rule specifically is 110 in binary. Then we start to define all the compression decompression actions for each header field. As we have seen previously in Dominic's talk, most of the traffic is static. That's the reason why most of them are not sent, as we can see here. The IPv6 version and traffic are left equal are not sent. This means that if an ICMP packet arrives at the core, these two fields will be present and equal to the target value, but they will not be sent to the device. The same goes for the next header and, of course, the dev ID prefix and dev IID, which corresponds to the IPv6 address of the device. Then we have other fields that cannot be compressed, since they might vary from one packet to another. An example of that is the app prefix and the app IID. This cannot be compressed, since this corresponds to any IPv6 in the world that will send an echo request to our device. Then, we define two fragmentation rules. One for uplink, here, and the other one for downlink. In this case, we will use rule 12 for downlink, which means from the core to the device, and rule 13 for uplink, from the device to the core. In addition to the rule ID, and the length, we also have to define other parameters for the fragmentation. In this case, the fragmentation mode, which is a con error, the direction, and the DTAC window FCN tiles and L2 sizes. We also define the way that the acknowledgement is sent. In this case, it is sent after the old one. We also define whether or not there is a tile included in the last fragment. In this case, we will not have a tile inside the last fragment. In your case, if you want to set up your own set of rules, you need to consider that the compression rule must be adapted to your environment meaning that you should put here the public address or your device. And that the target value in the dev prefix would be sent to the prefix or your domain, here. Going back to the core code, right after the definition of the rule manager, we also need to define some other parameters. First, we have the position, which in this case is the core. Then we have the socket port that will be used to send and receive UDP packets. Then we need to define the core ID. Similarly to the device ID, what we need here is to have the public IPv4 address of this specific device. Then we concatenated it with the port. And then we also need the device ID that will be taken from the rule here. Then we define a tunnel, which is a classic socket using the socket library of Python. We also define a lower layer object, which is used to send and receive chic packets. 
Then we also define a system which is created to manage events as in an event driver simulator. All these parameters allow us to create a chic machine in charge of processing packets for compression and fragmentation. This is the chic machine. Here we put inside all the parameters we have just defined. Then we associate the rule manager we have created to this chic machine. Finally, we call the SNIP function of SCAPI to store the chic machine. The SNIP function can be seen as an infinite loop that allows us to look at the packets passing through the specific interface. More or less the same as we do in Wireshark. In our case, the interface we will listen to is ENS3. As we can see, each time a packet arrives, we call the process packet function. Let's see what is inside this function. Long story short, what we do inside the function is to process two kinds of packets. A UDP packet carrying chic messages or an IPv6 packet using the chic machine. The filtering of these two kinds of packets is done using SCAPI. Once we are in this part of the code, we are sure that the packet that has arrived to the interface is an UDP packet with the corresponding socket port so that we know that inside there is a chic message. On the other hand, if we are in this part of the code, we are handling an IPv6 packet that includes the ICMP requests that have arrived from the user side. Once we are here, we can start to perform chic actions. To do that, we just need to call the chic receive function, which will handle the packet to either decompress or reassemble and then decompress the packet. On the other side, if what we have is an IPv6 packet, we need to call the chic machine by calling the chic send function. Inside the function, the IPv6 packet will be, pro will be processed and the chic action will be triggered based on the traffic received. Since we have received an IPv6 packet with ICMP traffic, the chic machine will then apply compression and fragmentation using this rule. To summarize, what has happened is the following. A user from anywhere in the world has sent an ICMP request to our device. This packet arrives first as the core instance, a chic. The packet has been filtered and passed to the chic machine using the chic receive function. Then, it has been compressed, and depending on the packet length, it has been fragmented and then sent to the device. Let's now see what happened inside the device chic instance of OpenShift. As we did on the core side, we also filter UDP packets to retrieve chic messages. We pass it then to the chic receive function to the chic machine. This function returns none if the chic packet is a fragment or the full packet if the reassembly process has finished. The next step, once we have decompressed and reassembled the packet, is to create the egg reply. This function here returns an ICMP equal reply packet. Inside the function, we use the SCAPI library to create the packet. We parse the equal request packets that we have just received with the SCAPI, and then we just need to change the an app to create the response. Finally, we call the chic send function that will initialize the chic functions. 
First, it will compress the packet and then send the fragments to the core instance. Here. Let's run the code to see what happens on both sides. Here we have the core and here the device. Finally, the echo request will be sent from here. We run the code on both instances. Here is for the core and now for the device. First, what we can see is the set of rules. As we have discussed earlier, here you have the device ID, then the rule ID 6, which is the compression rule, and then the two fragmentation rules. And as you can see, it is exactly the same at the device side. At the user side, we sent a ping sys request with the following command. C equals to one means that only one packet will be sent. And we force it to be 200 bytes length. As we can see on the user side, we send one packet and we receive the response. One packet transmit and one packet receive. Let's see what has happened on the core side. Let's go back. So first, as we have seen, we just uh, show the rules, the set of rules. Then we effectively received the IPv6 packet. So now we need to call the chic send that will initiate the uh, chic uh, compression and the fragmentation. As we can see here, the first thing it does is to parse the packet. Here we have all details of this IPv6 packet containing the ICMP request. Then we call the rule manager and then we try to match this parsed packet with the set of rules we have inside. Here, OpenShake is telling us that he has found a compression rule, which is the number six. Then the packet is compressed and here we have the compression result, which is the compression residue plus the data. Then we create a fragmentation session using a con error with rule ID 12. Here we have all the fragments. So we sent one, two, three, and etc. fragments to the device. Let's see what we have here. On the device. If we go back again, we have here the compression and fragmentation rules, and then we get a packet. This packet corresponds to a fragment. So here we create a reassembly session and we start to receive all the packets. Here we have uh, several packets one, two, and etc. Until we finish. Here, once the reassembly process has finished, we show a dump of the IPv6 packet with the ICMP request. Now, what we need to do is to create the echo reply that will be then compressed and then fragmented and sent back to the core. This is the opposite process that we have just done. Which is the same first, we compress the packet. This is the result of the compression. 
and then we'll start to send the fragment here. On the other side, on the core side, we should see the traces from the packets of the fragment we have received. Reassemble a con error, and then we start to receive all the fragments one, two, and etc. Finally, what we have here is the echo reply that we have just received from the device. Then we sent it back to the user. Here is the echo. And then at the user side, we choose have seen that we actually have received the group. That's how it works for the ICMP traffic. To summarize our ICMP example here, we have all the changes made between the different servers. First, we have a user that sent an ICMP echo request. Then it arrives to the core. It is tuned over IPv4 to the OpenShift instance at the core side. Then the OpenShift instance at the core side look at the bucket and tries to find a rule that can be applied to this. It finds a compression rule, the rule ID6. Then it compresses and fragments it using rule 11, which is a con error. Then it starts to send all the different fragments to the device. The first one corresponds to FCN62 until the old one, which has the RCS. All the different chic fragments arrive at the UDP tunnel. Then it starts to receive all the fragments and to assemble them. Once assembled, it decompresses using the rule ID 6. Then, once the process of decompressing an assembly of the fragment is finished, it sent back an acknowledgement. Then the device will create an ICMP echo reply. Once created, the device will also compress the packet and apply the fragmentation rule, which in this case is the rule 13. Then it sent back all the fragments to the core side. Then at the core side, all the fragments are assembly and decompressed, and then the core will send back an acknowledgement. Then the core will reply with the echo reply over the IPv4 tunnel, which will be sent back to the application. That's all for the compression and fragmentation process of an ICMP echo request and echo reply. In addition to the ICMP example, I will also show you an example using LoRaWAN and Coop. This is the architecture we will use. It is composed of a PyCommand device. This device will be sending each 10 seconds the temperature. This data is represented in a seaboard mode as chic messages, which will be the payload of a LoRaWAN message that will be modulated using the LoRa modulation. The chic messages will arrive at the radio gateway. The payload is related to the LNS, the LoRa network server. As LNS, we will use the one from the Things network, a connector that manages the communication with the LNS and sends the CBAR messages to OpenSHIC, process them with the UDP tunnel we saw before. As for the OpenSHIC, we will use a similar program as the one used for the core side of the ICMP example. It receives and sends devices traffic from one side and sends and receives co-op messages on the other side. Finally, as an application in this example, we will use a co-op server, which is an open source implementation in Python called IO Co-op. The co-op server has not been modified and runs pure co-op code. Let's start with the device side. For the device, we use a real connected object using the low pipe with a temperature sensor. Let's see what is inside the code. What is great with LowPy is that LowPy is programmed with MicroPython, which is the version of the language for embedded systems to process data. The code can be accessed at the OpenShift repository inside examples, 
then SCATI, and then client.py. First, we define several parameters needed to create a LoRa socket object that will create LoRaWAN packets to be sent to the LNS. Then, we perform the LoRaWAN authentication procedure. To do that, we define the app UI and the app key. This value should be the same used at the TTN site. Here. Then, we call the LoRa.join function and we are all set to start to send and receive co-op messages with SHIP. What we want to do in this example is to send regularly the temperature value. But if we receive an error notification from the server, then we reduce the sending period to save batteries. This is done using this function. As we can see, we define a period of 10 seconds, and then, if there is an error, we increase this period to 30 seconds. What we do each time is to call the sendqa function. As you can notice, for the device in this case, we do not use OpenSHIC. Instead, we create directly the SHIC message to be sent to the LNS. The sendqa function does the following. First, we bind the F438, which corresponds to the row ID. Then, what we do is to increase the message ID by 1 each time a packet is created. Then, we define the URI index here into bits. And then, we finally create the chic residue here. The six message is just those two values concatenate. Then the payload is just the measurement that we have just sunset. Then we just send the packet using the send function of LoRaWAN. Then we tell the LoPi to listen to the channel for packets coming on F438. If it receives a notification, the reverse view is just that notification that we display here. And then we raise the sending period here. Let's see what they have until now. The device has created a chic message containing co-op data. This message is composed by the rule ID, which is on the F port. Then we have six bits for the F ID, then two bits for the URI path index, and then as payload, we have the measurement of the temperature. This compressed packet is sent to the radio gateway that will relay it to the LNS. Then there is a connection using HTTPS with the connector that will send the data using Cbor over UDP. And then at the OpenSheet side, we use a similar code as the one used for the ICMP example. Let's see what they have inside. The code used for this OpenSheet instance can be found at examples scapy, then co-op core3.py. Similar to the core code of the previous example, we first define a rule manager, where instead of having ICMP rules, we have defined a new rule for compressing co-op traffic. This rule can be found here. First, we have the IPv6 header that has not changed from the previous example. The UDP headers will not be sent, as we can see here. The dev and app port are shared between both entities, so we don't, we don't need to have it. And then for the len and the checksum that will be computed on the other side. And then we have defined different fields necessary to handle co-op. In this case, we will not use fragmentation. Only compression will be used. Let's execute the code. We have several windows here in this example. Here we have the object control panel. Here is the display of the connector, which will communicate with the LNS and OpenSheet. Here is OpenSheet with the core code. And finally here, we have the server. We also have a Wireshark to see the traffic between OpenSheet and the co-op server. Let's start with the object. It joins the network and then sends its first request.
we can see the residue. It's in binary 50100. The first six bits are the MID, and the last two bits, the reference in the matching list to the URI temperature. We can see that the message is received by the connector, and then by OpenCheck, which sends an IPv6 packet to the server. Wireshark shows us the message. We can notice that the server displays the temperature value and does not positively acknowledge the server thanks to the no response option. We can see that in a very small code on the device, we can interact with a regular co-op server and the traffic on the LP1 link is really constrained. The rule ID is carried by the F port and the overhead is just the residue which in this example is only one bit. Every 10 seconds, we have a message from the device. Now, let's suppose that the application programmer made a mistake and that instead of temperature in his code, is misspelling and forgot to type A. In this case, the co-op server will return a negative notification 404 to indicate that the URI does not exist. The non-response option in the request does not block the sending of the notification, as we see in Wireshark. OpenSheet compress the response and set a residue contained in the code. The device receives it and changes the period to 30 seconds in our case to preserve energy and test where, when the problem it will be correct. That's all for the demonstration. Thank you for your attention. I now give the floor to Lauren to tell us about the GI models and end device reconfiguration. Thank you, Ivan, for the demo. Until now, we have shown the way compression and fragmentation work, but we didn't talk how the rules can be installed or modified. Of course, the rule management is something important. To do this, the working group LP1 selected the Young modeling data language. This language is well used by the IETF and other organizations to create data models used ever to configure or monitor systems. Once the data model is defined, it can use different formats to represent the information. This can be XML, JSON, or recently CBOR. And different protocol can be used to transport this representation. The protocol is called NetConf if it uses SSL and XML, RESConf if it uses HTTPS, and recently the use of CBOR and CoAP was possible with CoreConf. The rule representation we define through the Young Data Model are just for exchange. Each implementation can keep its own representation, which is optimized for its environment and programming language. We just need to standardize the exchange. We see this in this picture. For example, a core chic needs a set of rules for a specific device. It can query repository and get the information. Generally, we don't have any constraint on the network, so the representation can be XML or JSON. But we can imagine that the device wants to communicate with the core and vice versa. It can be, for instance, when the core informs the device of the IPv6 prefix. In that case, we are using a constraint network and coreconf is recommended. Before looking at the chic young data model, let's have a look at a simpler data model for Pokemon cards. You or your children know about these cards and a Pokemon expert can easily find the information he needs by looking at a specific location on the card. An example of the data model can look like this. It starts with some definition regarding the young data model. 
The most important thing is to give a unique identifier to our data model. This way, there will be no confusion if someone else develops a slightly different data model. Of course, for data model issued by an organization, the URI is on its naming space. We define our Pokemon card with the keyword container. Inside, we define several leaves, which will contain the information regarding the card. Here, we have a name, and we impose some constraint. This name has to be a string with a length between 1 and 10 characters, and each card must contain this information. Then, we have a hit point, which contains a number. This number is optional. As you or your children know, each Pokémon can have several attacks. To allow several instances, we are using a list. A list contains several leaves. One or more leaves will be viewed as a key and must be unique among all the elements. In our case, it will be attack. We could have used a string to represent the attack. But since several Pokémon can have the same attack, we prefer to standardize the name and therefore we create identifiers. This is done here. We use a special keyword, identify, to create a base type and the same keyword to derive attacks from this base value. And then we define a tap that will be used to create the leaf. Finally, we can add some extra check to validate the information. For instance, in our model, the power leaf must only be used with the amnesia attack. What is interesting now is to manipulate our data model. The advantage with Pyong is that a lot of tools are available. Here we are using Pyong, and first we ask for identifier in the data model. We find the leave names, but also the identifier we define for attack. It can also be represented as a young tree, where we can find the hierarchy. The leaf type, the key for a list, and if a list is mandatory or not. Now that we have a basic knowledge of a young modeling language, let's go back to Chic. We are not going to details all the model. It will be very boring. But you can access it on the ITF site. We define a container for the Chic rules. It will contain a set of rules for a specific device. A rule is identified by the rule ID value and length. And for each rule, we define a nature. It's an identifier indicating if it's a compression, no compression, or fragmentation rule. Regarding the compression rule, each rule will contain a list of fields. Of course, we checked that the rules specify a compression. Some of the leaves in the field will be well-known identifier, such as the field ID, the direction, the matching operator, or the CDA. The other will be integer. Target value has a specific format. We generalize a format for matching list with a list containing a position and a binary entry. Of course, if there is only one element, the index is zero. This leads to this young tree. For fragmentation, we will find the parameters specified in RFC 8724 on the three fragmentation modes. One interesting point is how we manage a timer value. Currently, Chic target LP1 the network, but we have other use case that goes from real-time system to space communications. So timer are defined with two values. One is the incrementation step. The formula for incrementation is 2 power n divided by 10 power 6 microseconds. So if n equals 0, the incrementation step is in microsecond. If n equal 20, the incrementation step is a little bit more than one second. And the maximum value is about 19 hours, which is in conformance with the LoRa1 specification for Chic. If n has a higher value, then we can have timer on days. How does it work? Here we have three different rules for OpenChic. As you have seen, the rules are defined in JSON and OpenChic adds the default parameters. We can see the rule how they are stored in the rule manager. If we ask the rule following our data model in JSON, in that case, the three rules generate a file about 2,700 bytes. How does it work with forconf? We must convert the identifier into number with Pyong. Each identifier has a unique number. The value is managed by INA, which will attribute a range for the chic data model. Currently, 
We do not have this range. The work is under process. So in this example, we choose 1 million. As you see, leaves and identifiers have a value. These values are called SID for schema identifier. If we take the core conf representation in CBOR, we have this sequence with a size reduced by a factor of 5. Here is not easy to read, but this is the equivalent of the previous JSON file in a canonical format. The first number identifies the chic data model. The hierarchy is represented by a CBOR map and key values are coded through deltas. So the 1 here represents the rule and 4 the entry, etc. etc. And the value in front of the key is either an integer or an identifier. Now, how do we navigate in the data to get or modify the information? As you remember, list elements are identified by keys. So keys allow to get a specific value. Here, we represent the rule hierarchy. We have a list containing each rule identifier by the rule ID value and the rule ID length. Compression rules are identified by the fee ID, their position, and the direction. Finally, the target value is identified by its index. So if we want to access to a specific field, we have to specify its identifier, or SID, and all the index. For instance, I can do a GET with this value, but the query string is in ASCII. With a fetch, the same query string will be coded in CBOR and in binary. The answer returns the value. Here is the up limit target value in a rule. And with I patch, we can set another value. So I hope I didn't afraid you with the young representation. We have a lot of formalism to define a data model, but also a lot of tools exist to deal with this formalism. And since the result is well defined, and thanks to CoreConf, when we go to the network, we have something very compact. The result is a simple navigation on a tree. For instance, the OpenSheet code is 16 lines of Python. The structure is easily extendable. If you want to compress other protocols than those defined in the RFCs, then you define your own identifiers and get seeds for them. This is still a work in progress. We have defined a set of rules for each device, but devices are not currently identified in the data model. The next step will be to add device identifiers and access control. Thank you. And now we are going to see how the LoRa Alliance use Chic and Usain will present metering application with Chic. Thank you all for explaining Chic. What I will do now is to explain how to use Chic on a specific LP1, starting with LoRa1. LoRa stands for long range. It uses a chirp spread the spectrum modulation on license free spectrum to enable long range and deep signal penetration. And while LoRa is the physical layer, LoRa1 standard defines the communication protocol and system architecture. The standard is defined by the LoRa Alliance, an open non-profit association with the mission to support LoRa1. LoRa1 uses a star topology and allows different classes of devices, each with different availability and power needs. To illustrate the need for Chic to enable internet protocols over LoRa1, let us check together the maximum payload size in LoRa1. The tables in front of you are taken from the regional parameters document from the LoRa Alliance, and they present the LoRa1 payload for different data rates. As you see, worst case LoRa1 application payload sizes are too small to transport IPv6 headers, let alone additional upper layer headers or application payload. Furthermore, LoRa1 does not natively provide fragmentation, so an adaptation layer is required to enable IPv6 based application over a LoRa1 layer 2 medium. 
So, in line with the, in line with the IoT technology convergence around IPv6, the LoRa Alliance released the technical specification TS10. This specification specifies Chic as the IPv6 adaptation layer for LoRa1. It make use of IETF standards RFC 8724 and RFC 9011. As a first important note, the IPv6 adaptation layer Chic works with all versions of LoRaWAN and all regional parameters and with all classes of devices. Actually, Chic operates on a point-to-point -point logical link between two Chic entities. In the context of LoRaWAN, these two entities are considered application layer as you see in the diagram to the right. So the two entities are first the Chic protocol implemented in the application layer of the device and second the Chic protocol implemented as a Chic gateway northbound of application server or collocated with it. So when a device is using IPv6 applications, headers are compressed and then compressed messages are fragmented if their size is more than the LoRa1 MTU. The resulting information is sent on the LoRa1 link to the gateway. The gateway forwards the frames to the network server. The network server sends the data to the Chic gateway for assembly and to compression. A similar process is done for the messages in the other direction with end devices as destination. Note that Chic implementations at the device and at the Chic gateway should know in advance the context and share the same rules before message exchange. To identify a chic rule, each transmitted message starts with an identifier we call rule ID. As per specifications, the port field F port of LoRa1 frame is used to carry the rule ID. And here we have two possibilities. The first possibility if a fragmentation is applied. Then the rule ID that appears in the F port field is that of the applied fragmentation, while the compression rule ID is carried in the first fragment's payload. The second possibility if a fragmentation is not applied, then the rule ID used for compression appears in the F port of the LoRa1 frame. Note that the rule ID is 8 bits and should be in the range between 1 and 223. For the sake of interoperability, three rule IDs are recommended for, for LoRa1. Rule ID 20 for uplink fragmentation, rule ID 21 for downlink fragmentation, and rule ID 22 for the case of no compression. One of the essential points in enabling IPv6 over LoRa1 is how to calculate the IPv6 interface identifier. TS10 of the LoRa Alliance and RFC 9011 from IETF specify that the IPv6 IID should be calculated using the AESC MAC algorithm with the device extended unique identifier DevAUI and ap application session key apps key as parameters. The IID is the first 8 byte of the result of the AES algorithm as you see in the example in front of you. So input are DivAUI and apps key and the first 8 bytes are the IID. The, AI, the AES mechanism is not only compatible with IETF but it is the same algorithm defined in the LoRaWAN protocol. By using this algorithm, the generated IPv6 IID does not disclose the device AUI and it changes with each change of the device security session. Now, let us have more details on chic mechanisms for LoRaWAN. First, the same compression mechanisms explained by Dominique are used for chic over LoRaWAN. 
This means that nothing specific in compression for the LoRaWAN technology and all compression and decompression actions that are explained in this tutorial can be used to compress and decompress headers. Second, when padding is required, the padding bits are zeros. Now for fragmentation, ACK on error is used for uplink from the device to the application server or to the application. ACK always is used for downlink and no ACK is used for the downlink multicast. So let's focus on uplink fragmentation. In uplink fragmentation, as I mentioned, ACK on error is used. This means that the SHIC receiver will only signal will only signal the missing tiles to optimize the downlink. In addition, two bits are used for a Windows index. This means that up to four windows are allowed. Six bits are used for FCM field. This means that each window is composed of maximum of 63 bytes or 63 tiles. And remember that the FCM field with all one bits is reserved for signaling the last tile of the entire chic message. So only 63 tiles are allowed in each windows. Finally, the tile size is, is specified to be 10 bytes for LoRa 1. So let's do the calculation. Four windows times 63 tiles times 10 bytes in each tile will give us 2,520 bytes for the MTU. So, as you see, using Chic as adaptation layer for IPv6, LoRaWAN link can deliver the 1280 bytes MTU required by IPv6. Now focusing on fragmentation in downlink. ACK always is used, and this means that the device will always acknowledge when it receives a Chic window. One bit is used for labeling the windows, and this bit alternates between 0 and 1. For the FCN field, it's one bit. And it is one only when the last fragment is sent. The tag is not used in LoRa 1, so there can be no more than one chic packet in transit for each fragmentation rule ID. It's very important to note that chic timers, such as retransmission timer and inactivity timer, are used to trigger the retransmission and avoid unnecessary waiting of the receiver for certain messages. Now, let us have a look on the format of uh, different types of, fragment, of fragments used during uplink fragmentation session. So as you see in the front of you, each uplink fragment follows a specific structure where the links of each field is well defined. As an example, let us take the regular fragment, that one in the top uh, to the left. We have the role ID in the F port with 8 bits. We have the W2 bits for Windows labeling. We have the FCN for following up the tiles and we have the payload. For the all one fragment, for example, we have W of 2 bits again to say which windows. And we have the FCN, which is now all one to say that, okay, this is the last message. This is the last at uh, the end of the chic message. And we have the RCS to ensure the integrity of uh, the fragmentation. We have a uh, chic act with correct RCS. We have chic uh, act with incorrect RCS. So if you check the chic act with incorrect RCS, you can see that we have compressed bitmap. So here I want to highlight very important detail about chic and in particular over LoRa 1. So she works on the level of bit. In addition, we have the compression of the bitmap, uh, and this will reduce the size of the downlink message, which is very important. Indeed, so we have also for a, for a format for the fragments used in downlink fragmentation. I will not present them, and you can refer to RFC 9011, and TS10 for more details. Now, before I move to the applications, uh, I want to highlight that uh, uh, ongoing efforts are being made 
to make certification the LoRa Alliance for Chic over LoRa One. So be ready for this. Now, the big question: Where can we use Chic over LoRa One? What are the applications? With Chic, many applications can be extended or retrofitted with with the LoRa One connectivity by compressing the headers and possibly the payload. The size of application message can be reduced significantly. And if the message is still exceeding the LoRa One payload, Chic fragmentations provide the solution. So Chic can help in practice in enabling and optimizing several upper layers and applications. I will mention DTLS, Lightweight M2M, Backnet, Modbus, Ambus, and others. For Coop, TS010 recommends using the IETF RFC8824, and uh, this specifies the chic for Coop. One of the usage that I expect to highly leverage from chic is a smart home application based on IPv6 which will profit from the LoRaWAN advantages such as long range and deep penetration. Indeed, all the mentioned applications and use cases uh, need uh, a lot of time to be explained. What I will be doing is focusing on a specific application, which is DLMS. So what is DLMS? DLMS is a leading and well-known standardized data exchange protocol and certification program that guarantees interoperability and secure data exchange to support energy, water, and gas infrastructures. It defines an object-oriented data model, an application layer protocol, and media-specific communication profiles. DLMS uh, actually brings a lot of benefits such as certified interoperability, scalability, and many others. So in response to the growth market demand, the DLMS User Associa Association, DLMS UA, specified a new communication profile for LP1s in the Blue Book release 14. The, the meter sends standardized DLMS COSM data transported in IPv6 packet through the LoRaWAN network. To do so, the packets are processed, which means compressed and fragmented using Chic. Note that the defined architecture ensures that, the, that each layer is implemented according to the standard. The DLMS application environment is maintained end-to-end. -end. The LoRaWAN link is transparent to the hidden system. And thanks to Chic, LoRaWAN connected meters are similar to classic DLMS IPv6 devices. Consequently, utilities now can use LoRaWAN connectivity only or include LoRaWAN as a complementary in their existing infrastructure. As I mentioned before, the DLMS specified a communication profile for LoRaWAN. This profile is based on the internet protocol, I mean UDP uh, IP. Thus, it mandates check and adaptate as an adaptation layer. Moreover, to lower the volume of traffic and to optimize the media usage, the DLMS profile for LP1 recommends pre-association as well as push mode instead of session-oriented communication. In other words, the meters are configured to periodically sending message, and when required, hidden system can initiate on-demand queries to the meter for specific data reads. This allows maintaining the same level of service and security with a lot of reducing traffic. Of course, Reducing traffic does not mean in any way that the LMS meters will not send the information required by the utility, but only aims at optimizing the use of media resources. Another question which can be here asked is how much she can achieve in terms of compression. So, if we consider headers only, the 48 bytes of IPv6 and UDP headers and the 8 bytes of the DLMS wrapper can be compressed into 1 to 3 bytes. This is amazing because it's around 90% of compression ratio. Now, if we consider the whole IPv6 UDP DLMS message, she can achieve 
around 70% of compression ratio, as you see in the example in front of you. Now let us enjoy a demo of the LMS over IPv6 over Shake over LoRa1. What is in my hand is a LoRaWAN-based DLMS Smart Electricity Meter manufactured by Kaifa. After measuring many parameters, this meter sends DLMS COSIM data over UDP over IP over LoRaWAN by using SHIC. The Akilu SHIC implementation in the LoRaWAN module compresses headers and possibly payloads and apply fragmentation when it's required. There are several types of messages and profiles that are sent by the meter. As an example, the loader profile is sent periodically every 30 minutes in this example. It includes many parameters such as energy consumption, power, power factor, voltage, and others. She compresses the message, then applies a fragmentation when the compressed message size is more than the LoRa1 NTU. Where the fragments are sent over the LoRa1 link to the SHIG gateway. The SHIG gateway reassembles the fragments, then decompresses the packet, and then sends the reconstructed DLMS over UDP over IPv6 to the head end system. In front of us is the KFA head end system, where we can see the meter readings, request specific parameters and control the meters. As you can see, the load profile is received every 30 minutes. To check the fragments of the messages sent by a DLMS over LoRa1 meter, I will use one of Achilles tools, the SHIG debugger. The SHIG debugger shows the frames received by the SHIG gateway on the left side. In this example, we can see that the message was sent via three fragments with the rule ID 20. Rule ID 20 is the recommended value for uplink fragmentation. Indeed, the windows and the FCN fields allow the SHIG gateway to follow the tile sequence, and the all one fragment signals that the very last tile of the SHIG packet has been transmitted. Once the SHIG gateway verifies that all the tiles are received, it replies with an acknowledgement. The SHIG gateway assembles the SHIG message and then decompress it as shown on the right side. We can also check the decompressed message where the IP and UDP headers can be easily recognized. In addition to checking the event logs, controlling the meter, and reading parameters of different profiles, the head end system can request the specific parameters from the meter. For example, let us request the voltage. As you see, the SHIG packets appear at the SHIG gateway and we see the voltage in front of us. Finally, it is important to know that you should follow the blue book from the LMS UA, TS10 from the LoRa Alliance, RFC8724 and RFC9011 from IETF in order to achieve a compliant LMS over LoRa1 electric metering solution. So in order for you to integrate SHIG technology within your products or test it within your labs, I can you open the developer program to the public and this is the place to find anything you need for IPv6 based LoRaWAN solution. The community additions allow you to have free access to the technology with rich and well-documented open source examples, including the DLMS. By registering, you will have access to the SHIC library, SHIC gateway or IP uh, core access, open source examples, and online documentation. The device firmware developed within this program is free to use, including in commercial products. With this program, you will have IPv6 based solution for a very short time to market. And based on our experience, this is one week to one month. You just have to register using that provided link. So, try it. And now, I will start to show you how to apply SHIC for NB-IoT. But before, let us have a very fast look on this technology.
So narrowband IoT is a cellular radio access technology developed by 3GPP and use subset of uh, LTE standards in order to support massive deployment of constraint IoT devices. It is a narrowband technology that can operate in a system bandwidth as narrow as 180 kilohertz. Within the MBIO team, there are many power savings such as CDRX, ADRX, PSM, and the objective is to boost the energy efficiency. Moreover, NB-IoT devices can be used in both IP and non-IP modes. So the question, which one we choose, IP or non-IP? In fact, each of the approaches has its advantages and drawbacks. While IP approach provides interoperability, longevity, and independence of technology, and a lot of existing end-to-end -end protocols and frameworks, non-IP approach boosts the energy efficiency by, avo by avoiding power-hungry IP stack and reducing the total number of messages. As such, how we get the best of the two technologies? How we can make IP communications as energy efficient as possible? And how can we keep all the amazing energy efficiency gains of non-IP and not sacrifice interoperability? So, let's start with IP communication. In front of us is the 3GPP architecture, which composed of the user equipment, Evolved Node B or the base station, MME or the mobility management entity, which is responsible of several things such as managing signaling. We have also the CSGW, which is the cellular surfing gateway that routes and forwards the user data packets. We have the PGW, which is the packet data node gateway that is responsible of IP allocation after a user equipment is attached to the network. And of course, we have finally the application server. Now, when an IP device wants to send a message on MBIoT, it performs the following step. First, it attached to the network. Second, it obtains the, uh, the IP address Third, it retrieves the server to connect to. Fourth, it establishes a secure connection, and this involves several handshake messages. Then it sends the data and the headers, and finally it disconnects. Now imagine that the data to be sent by the device is only five bytes. In this case, the device still needs to go into all the steps I just described and it will need to send a total of 61 bytes. Here I'm talking about the headers in addition to the five bytes. So IPv6, let's say, is 40 bytes, UDP is eight bytes, and DTLS typically has 13 bytes. So this is actually frustrating. To send five bytes, we send 61 bytes. Now, let's go into an IDD to see how things happen. So we are now in non-IP and BIOT or what we call or what is called an IDD, non-IP data delivery. In this case, data can be sent using NAS, NAS signaling, non-access stratum. Not only the IP stack is not sent, but by sending data via the MME by encapsulating them in the NAS, the total number of control plane messages is reduced. In fact, the MME will act as the network interface between the mobile and the SCEF. So I did not define the SCEF. The SCEF is the Service Capability Exposure Function, which is designed to securely expose the services and capabilities provided by the network. So, if we have a non-IP device, non-IDD, that wants to send a message, it performs the following step. It attaches to the network, send the data through signaling, and disconnect. So as you see, in addition to not sending the IP stack headers, an IDD requires lower number of steps. However, this comes with the expense of lo losing the benefits of IP protocol and interoperability. 
So we have uh, actually uh, surveyed and exchanged with several MBIOT stakeholders, and we have identified several challenges for IP and non-IP and BIOT. What I'll do is that I will highlight some of them. So starting with the common challenge, latency is an important factor to be considered, especially in bad, bad radio condition. Why? Because it may lead to handshake failure and non-successful transmission of high volume data. So here we have latency and we have success, successful transmission. In addition, reaching a device might be challenging due to uh, energy efficiency techniques like PCM, PSM. We have also the possibility of firewalls blocking certain exchange. Furthermore, although NBIOT is rich in energy efficiency mechanisms, they change from device to device and from network to network. So they do not have the same configuration. Now, for IP approach, there are several challenges. One, power consumption, as I mentioned, that IP stacks are power hungry. Second, if we have TCP TLS connections, they might fail because of latency and packet loss. Moreover, we have firewalls that can limit connections such as UDP and uh, so uh, such as UDP connections. And finally, we have the issues with NAT and PAT. Now for an IDD for non IP and BIOT. The big concern is interoperability. We are losing the IP interoperability and we cannot use a lot of uh, standard protocol, especially tho those who are required for high volume deployments. So back to the previous question, how to get the best of, the bo of both approaches and overcome challenges? In fact, employing Sheik can solve many of the challenges and pain points. Uh, Sheik can be used with an IDD as well as IP-based and BIoT. So with an IDD, the device can benefit from having IPv6 and still having the energy efficiency advantages. We will show you through numbers later. As most of the headers are compressed using Sheik, so okay, we have an IDD above it. We have Sheik to compress the IPv6 and UDP headers. And in the IP case, in IP and BIOT, we will have end-to-end -end communication, overcoming, overcoming the NAT path problem, and reducing traffic and energy consumption, as we will show you with numbers later on. So now I will show you the solution uh, uh, developed by Akilu. And the objective is to achieve energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient, interoperable, and secure communication. And this is done by combining optimized DATLS and Sheik. So Achilles solution composes of first employing Sheik for compression. And this means the compression of the IPv6 UDP DTLS headers and payload compression. At the level of DTLS, the handshake procedure is optimized as well as the handshake timers and the objective is to support high latency. The handshake intervals are controlled according to the message number and CID, connection ID functionality, is support. So what are the benefits of this solution? Regarding Sheik with an IDD, the an IDD device become IPv6 compatible. We enable the use of UDP and DTL commun uh, communication while maintaining energy efficiency. Uh, we do not have any issue with the uh, NAT uh, and PAT. Uh, the security handshake overhead is reduced, and this is because IP is managed by the Sheik adaptation uh, layer. Uh, in addition, Sheik helps to reduce the packet size, and thus latency, and thus packet loss. So, reducing the packet size means reducing transmission time, means also reducing the power consumption. Now with IP and BIOT, um, Achilles Chic enables secure end-to-end -end IPv6 communication over public IPv4 networks without issues related to NAT and PAT. The solution as well compressed the TDLS header with extended timers in order to cope with 
high latency network and due to high uh, header and payload compression the energy consumption is reduced so let us check the implemented protocols before going into implementations and uh, and numbers we have three stacks the first stack is a typical ipv4 stack which we implement as a reference case the second case is chic with an idd we have udp and ipv6 or ipv4 uh, in addition to optimize detail us with chic over an idd the third case is chic with ipv4 where we have udp and ipv6 with optimized DTLS for NBIOT that uses Chic over IPv4. So thanks to the collaboration and the support of Nordic Semiconductor, we implement a new solution in the NRF9160 low power system in package, so the SEP, with integrated LTE and NBIOT mode. You're seeing it in front of you, and we make use of the NRF uh, connect SDK, which is the software development kit, and the ARM Cortex M33 dedicated processor. So we implemented it in the SIP of the of Nordic Semiconductor, and then we leverage Dutch Telecom IoT Access Provider, which is IoT Creator. So thank you to test a simple UDP application. So, Aculus solution composed of uh, two parts, one that is embedded in the NRF9160 and the other is the Chic gateway, which is IP code to the right, as you see. So, embedded in the NRF9160 and we place and we connect the IP code. So, uh, the NRF9160 is connected to an IDD in this case, thanks to IoT Creator. IoT Creator Platform is connected with Akilu IP Core to the DTLS proxy until the UDP server. So first, we have a very successful communication and we have the following traffic gains. So we're comparing three cases, standard DTLS, uh, DTLS UDP IP4, uh, DTLS UDP IP4 with Chic, and we have a uh, DTLS UDP IPv6. So compared to a standard uh, setup over IPv4, we were able to reduce the DTLS handshake volume by seven. So this is one of the remarkable things. And we were able to have 74% redu uh, reduction in traffic. So unable uh, to be able to Imagine the impact, the traffic reduction is equal to more than 365 gigabyte of data per year when scaling up the commercial uh, to a commercial network of 1 million devices. So such a saving represent reduced subscription cost, low power consumption, better latency and improved network capacity. Now to quantify the power consumption, with the support of Talis Engineer, we implemented Aculeus solution with the Talis model EXS82 uh, and use the LGA dev kit family. You have the link uh, to the right with the 9205 LTE modem. We do the me measurement using uh, the power measurement using OTII art by Kotec. And you can check it, it's the link to the left. And once again, thanks to IoT creators, we made the setup you, you see with the Talis, with the Talis AX uh, SE82. And the setup is done in a good radio condition. And we do test by sending payloads of 50 bytes. And the results are the following. We start with the case of an IDD. So, in the case of NIDD and in comparison with typical IPv4, I can use solution, which is, uh, as we said, check, uh, with NIDD and optimized DTLS. It's, uh, it achieves 76 energy saving for the handshakes and 19 
percent energy saving for data transfer. Now, let's go into IP and BIOT. So in comparison with typical IPv4, Aculus solution consisting of optimized uh, chic DTLS4 and BIOT over uh, IPv4 and combined with payload compression, it achieved 70% of energy saving for the handshakes and 13% of energy savings for data transfer. Now to imagine the impact, let us consider a meter doing a new DTLS handshake every day and, send, and then sending data five times each of 50 bytes, the power reduction of transmission is 35%. So, in summary, Chic is very useful in, in, in BIoT. It enriches an IDD with interoperability and boosts energy efficiency and reduces traffic for IP and BIoT. And as you see, we can use it with both IP and an IDD. Now, Dominique will talk about lightweight M2M -M compression. Thank you, Insane. I'm now going to describe an application that we've developed using lightweight M2M and what kind of results we get when we use Shake to compress those protocol headers for that application. So uh, we've built a RESTful application using Coop, um, and on top of Coop, we're using Lightweight M2M, which is a device management and application protocol uh, specified at OMS Backworks. Um, this um, protocol also comes with a collection of uh, object models um, specified either by OMS Backworks or IPSO or, or some other organizations. And within those collections, you can find pretty much everything you might want in terms of sensors or actuators, any kind you could be interested in. Uh, the data that's transported uh, with Lightweight M2M can be represented in JSON, which is not very compact, or using TLVs, uh, or CBOR, which is much more compact. In our case, we use TLV because CBOR was not available in the open source implementations of the protocols that we've used at the time of this study. And uh, of course, we transport co-op over a standard IP stack, UDP and IPv6, and uh, we secure uh, these uh, messages using two flavors of uh, security, DTLS at transport level, or score at object level. And we compress um, the protocol headers using Shik with a set of rules dedicated to each combination, uh, be it unsecured or secured with OSCO or secured with DTLS. And the, the goal again is to evaluate the cost of uh, using standard IP secured IP protocols uh, over an LP1 network uh, using Shik in various flavors of security. So the scenario we came up with is the uh, bike tracking application. You can figure a free floating bike that you pick up on the street in the morning before biking from home to work. Um, the first thing you would do is uh, unlock the bike. Uh, so there's a message going from a server somewhere in the cloud to the bike to unlock the, the bike lock. Then you bike uh, for about an hour during which the uh, IoT device on the bike will report the location uh, every five minutes. Um, and then as you arrive at the destination, you will lock the bike again. And uh, then during the evening, as you bike back to home, uh, same thing happens again. Over the whole uh, 24 hours, uh, the IoT device will send hard, hard bit messages to its server just to report on battery level and check connectivity. And because we, we're using Lightweight M2M, we're also sending uh, registration update messages to the Lightweight M2M server, which is part of the Lightweight M2M architecture. We've developed the application on a, an IoT uh, board with microcontroller and a P1 modem on the device side. 
and we use the uh, Leshan uh, implementation by of this lightweight and server by the Eclipse Foundation, which is open source. Uh, we captured the traffic between the server and the IoT device and dissected it using Wireshark to look at the uh, packets um, using uh, custom dissectors for the shake compressed packets. This is the results we get. So our application uh, actually uses only 18 different messages. The payload can vary, of course, but the headers uh, only constitute a collection of 18 different messages. Uh, we've numbered them 1 to 18. And here for reference in mid gray, we show the length of the uh, application layer message, which is the co-op uh, header, the lightweight M2M header, and the lightweight M2M payload uh, for those messages. And so uh, we see that the application layer message size ranges from 4 to uh, 100 bytes, with most of the messages being in the 15 to 20 bytes. The message 18 is the uh, registration to the server, which enumerates all the resources that the device has. And so this costs a lot in the payload. And the uh, small ones are just the uh, co-op control messages. Uh, now, if we carry this uh, application message uh, within a UDP IPv6 packet, then of course we had uh, the 48 bytes uh, for those protocol headers, 8 bytes for UDP, 40 bytes for IPv6. So it's a straight mechanical translation from these crosses to those ones here. And you have packets uh, that are about 60 to 70 bytes in length. Um, with the secured flavor, uh, it be it with DTLS or OSCOR, we have messages, we have packets that are in the size of 18 to 80 to 100 bytes for most of them. Um, now we're going to use Shake to compress those uh, messages and see how this looks. And so um, again, we still have this, the reference. This is just used for reference in our graph. It's the original co-op lightweight M2M payload message. And what we notice is that the compressed uh, IPv6 UDP co-op lightweight M2M message uh, packet is actually smaller than our reference. This is because we're compressing not only the IPv6 and UDP headers, uh, but also the co-op and lightweight M2M headers. And in this case, we're uh, compressing away most of uh, UDP and IPv6 and a good chunk of uh, co-op and lightweight M2M. Therefore, the resulting packet is actually smaller than the reference message. Now, if we look at the secure, secured version with DTLS and OSCOR, we have message sizes in the 20 to 30, 40 bytes, which is now totally compatible with most LP1 networks. Um, and um, the fragmentation might be needed in the rare cases where we have the absolute worst case on some of the LP1 networks with payloads in the order of 10 bytes. But it's still usable on LP1s. This data was for each individual message, um, irrespective of the frequency of occurrence of those messages during the whole day of uh, application. And now this is the accumulated data volume uh, for a full month. Uh, again, our reference uh, co apply to it into a message if it were transported just by itself would generate that volume of bytes. And uh, here the IPv6 UDP encapsulated uh, message and compressed, then compressed and secured with DTLS and compressed and compressed secured with our score and compressed and compressed. So basically what you can see is um, with compression, TTLS and OSCOR both uh, yield an overhead of about 50% compared to the original co-op application layer message. And so if you were considering transporting uh, your co-op related to a message over the row layer two of your LP1, 
then you might just as well uh, benefit from the full IP stack and the security of standard internet protocols and transport chick compressed DTLS packets or chick compressed OSCOR packets. Uh, the overhead will, will only be about 50%, which is uh, still manageable over the LP1s that we're considering. Uh, so in conclusion, we've shown that Chick significantly reduces the overhead of using standard secured internet protocols. Um, and the, the overhead is only a few bytes. Um, so the cost is totally bearable on LP1s. Um, the resulting packets fit, uh, fit into most uh, LP1 payloads. And maybe in the extreme cases, you might need fragmentation to transport them within a few uh, layer two messages in the worst case. Um, these results are shown uh, in terms of bytes that are conveyed over the LP1 network. Uh, we know having a smaller um, packet uh, goes in the right direction in terms of using less resource, less time on air, less energy to get, that, get them over the LP1 network but we're currently working on expanding this uh, work to evaluate the actual benefit in terms of energy consumption on your IoT device um, in various radio conditions and in various LP1 networks so that we can have uh, results and evaluate the benefits of Shake in terms of battery life for the IoT device. Um, as I said, the shake compression technology was provided to us by ACLIO for this study. And the uh, scenario, uh, the light to attempt implementations and measurements and some of the materials that I've presented here have been developed by my colleagues at uh, Orange Lab. Um, if you want to read more about that, you can. You have here the reference to our publication at Globum 21. Uh, which will describe in more details the uh, experiment implementations and results. Uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Georgios for uh, future works on Czech. And thank you very much. To conclude, we have shown you some use of Czech compression and fragmentation but the work is still ongoing. During the first year, the LP1 working group has focused on producing generic compression and fragmentation mechanism. The title of the RFC 8724 is quite explicit on that. This is a framework being ported on two different environments. Here are some evolution we foresee for Chic. Some of them are currently under investigation at the ITF, some of them are more prospective and require more investigations. The working group first work on the basic mechanism for LP1 star topology. This led to some open source and proprietary implementation. One important step is to finalize the architecture document, which better explain how chic can be used. As presented by Dominic, we can have layer chic each chic instance being confined by a technical boundary or a cryptographic barrier. A device may implement several chic instances that talk to different counterparts located at different locations on the network. The Young Data model for chic rules define a way to upload rules or modify them in an efficient and secure way thanks to CoreConf. OSCOR can be introduced to authenticate chic instances and encrypt traffic. The Young Data model for chic rules defines a way to upload rules and modify them in an efficient and secure way thanks to CoreConf. OSCOR can be introduced to authenticate chic instances and encrypt the traffic. One current ongoing discussion is how to structure the rule identifier in a way to protect both confidentiality and privacy. 
One nice improvement prompted by Sigfox, which is a LP1 network with very, very small payloads, is to propose to acknowledge several windows of ties with the same hack message. This improves the performance by reducing the number of downlink messages. Operation, administration and maintenance is a pending document. You have seen some OAM example when Yvan demonstrated the ping compression, but we can go further and integrate the device in the internet in a more seamless way. For example, in the co-op demonstration, we saw that the device can only receive notifications when an error occurs. For example, the URI of the device request is unknown by the server. But the server may also be unreachable. AOM with Chic will ensure that the device receives these ACMP error messages, thereby reducing the sending rate until the communication is established again. It could also be good to ping the device without sending ACMP messages over the LP1 network. This draft introduces the notion of proxy and the core chic may reply to a request on behalf of the device if the device has been seen active shortly before. It may be used by a management platform without any change to detect if the device is down or up. The group has also produced an important document discussing the chic architecture for narrowband IoT cellular networks. Dominique and Hussein demonstrated the use of Chic over LTM and narrowband IoT, but Chic was not in the core network. This new RFC shows where Chic can be introduced into the 3GPP architecture. Another direction is to extend the use of Chic on networks over than LP1's network. This has been discussed together with the Six Law Working Group. As Giorgio said in the introduction, Sixlopan and Chic belongs to the same family of compression protocol. Both do not attempt to identify flow before performing the compression. But Sixlopan has been designed for mesh network, where the address is important at each hop to for forwarding operation. Chic can remove the address since it assumes that it's a star or point-to-point -point topology. Nevertheless, Chic and Sixlopan work together. IPv6 is compressed with Sixlopan and routed inside the mesh network, then Chic can be used, for instance, for UDP and co-op. The main difficulty is to identify which node is a device and which node is the core, what is up and what is down. Chic architecture document handle these cases. What can be done in a mesh network can also be done on the internet, and to all of this, the process to get a protocol value for Chic has been initiated. This does not concern low throughput networks, but also real-time network where the header compression reduction can decrease latencies. The LoRa Alliance is also continuing to support Chic, as we saw for metering applications, but also to move over IP-based applications to LoRaWAN network. Some tests have been done with BACnet on Modbus, but over the month, are also under investigation. Regarding OpenChic, you may have noticed that there is still some effort to present in a more friendly fashion the Chic compression and fragmentation behavior. In fact, OpenChic was used during the standardization process to experiment both compression and fragmentation algorithm. We are now working to make OpenChic more accessible in order to understand how the protocol works but also to test new technical proposals. What makes the difference between Chic and other protocol is the use of rules that carry either field description or fragmentation parameter. There are no global value. In theory, each device may have its own configuration regarding the traffic or the network condition. Therefore, we can have a very fine tuning on rules instead of having to compromise between different usages. One interesting study is the rule selection for fragmentation. Currently, the selection procedure is very simple, but in the future, it can be more dynamic. For instance, select a no hack rule when the network quality is good or hack an error when the error rate increases. Several fragmentation rules can also coexist and be selected according to the message size. 
Sergio Aguilar proposes in a recent draft to do multi-technology fragmentation, sending fragments on different support. Chic and satellite communication can also be investigated. The higher bandwidth delay product may influence performance. Young Data Model is also a playground where CoreConf may be used instead of neighbor discovery to configure parameters in the rule to adapt them to their environment, learning, for example, a prefix or the MTU assigned to the link. Finally, we insist a lot on the fact that Chic continues to process datagram and is not flow-oriented. We do not have enough insight on how the compression rules will be generated. But as we see for DLMS, we certainly have some rules that will emerge for certain category of usage. These rules will contain compression residues that can be viewed as a new protocol format. In that case, we are modifying the architecture of the internet and instead of having the same protocol everywhere, we can have zone where a new format is defined. And chic will act as an equivalent class allowing to map one format into another while still guaranteeing global interoperability. As you see, there is still a lot to do with Chic. Thank you for listening to this tutorial, and now we are going to answer your questions.